This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amity McGinnis. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 24. Treats on a very poor subject, but is a short one and may be found of importance in this history. It was no unfit messenger of death who had disturbed the quiet of the matron's room. Her body was bent by age, her limbs trembled with palsy, her face, distorted into a mumbling leer, resembled more the grotesque shaping of some wild pencil than the work of nature's hand. Alas, how few of nature's faces are left alone to gladden us with their beauty! The cares and sorrows and hungerings of the world change them as they change hearts, and it is only when those passions sleep and have lost their hold forever that the troubled clouds pass off and leave heaven's surface clear. It is a common thing for the countenances of the dead, even in that fixed and rigid state, to subside into the long-forgotten expression of sleeping infancy, and settle into the very look of early life, so calm, so peaceful do they grow again, that those who knew them in their happy childhood kneel by the coffin side in awe, and see the angel even upon earth. The old crone tottered along the passages and up the stairs, muttering some indistinct answers to the chidings of her companion being at length compelled to pause for breath she gave the light into her hand and remained behind to follow as she might while the more nimble superior made her way to the room where the sick woman lay it was a bare garret room with a dim light burning at the farther end there was another old woman watching by the bed the parish apothecary's apprentice was standing by the fire making a toothpick out of a quill cold night mrs corney said this young gentleman as the matron entered "'Very cold indeed, sir,' replied the mistress, in her most civil tones, and dropping a curtsy as she spoke. "'You should get better coals out of your contractors,' said the apothecary's deputy, breaking a lump on the top of the fire with the rusty poker. "'These are not at all the sort of thing for a cold night.' "'They're the board's choosing, sir,' returned the matron. "'The least they could do would be to keep us pretty warm, for our places are hard enough.' The conversation was here interrupted by a moan from the sick woman. "'Oh!' said the young man, turning his face toward the bed, as if he had previously quite forgotten the patient. "'It's all you pee there, Mrs. Corney.' "'Is it? Is it, sir?' asked the matron. "'If she lasts a couple of hours, I shall be surprised,' said the apothecary's apprentice, intent upon the toothpick's point. "'It's a break-up of the system altogether. Is she dozing, old lady?' The attendant stooped over the bed to ascertain, and nodded in the affirmative." "'Then perhaps she'll go off in that way if you don't make a row,' said the young man. "'Put the light on the floor. She won't see it there.' The attendant did as she was told, shaking her head, meanwhile, to intimate that the woman would not die so easily. Having done so, she resumed her seat by the side of the other nurse, who had by this time returned. The mistress, with an expression of impatience, wrapped herself in her shawl and sat at the foot of the bed. The apothecary's apprentice, having completed the manufacture of the toothpick, planted himself in front of the fire and made good use of it for ten minutes or so. When, apparently growing rather dull, he wished Mrs. Corney joy of her job and took himself off on tiptoe. When they had sat in silence for some time, the two old women rose from the bed and, crouching over the fire, held out their withered hands to catch the heat. The flame threw a ghastly light on their shriveled faces, and made their ugliness appear terrible, as, in this position, they began to converse in a low voice. "'Did she say any more, Annie dear, while I was gone?' inquired the messenger. "'Not a word,' replied the other. "'She plucked and tore at her arms for a little time, but I held her hands, and she soon dropped off. She hasn't much strength in her, so I easily kept her quiet. I ain't so weak for an old woman, though I am on parish allowance. No, no.' "'Did she drink the hot wine the doctor said she was to have?' demanded the first. "'I tried to get it down,' rejoined the other. "'But her teeth were tight set, and she clenched the mug so hard that it was as much as I could do to get it back again. "'So I drank it, and it did me good.' "'Looking cautiously round, to ascertain that they were not overheard, "'the two hags cowered nearer to the fire and chuckled heartily. "'I mind the time,' said the first speaker, "'when she would have done the same "'and made rare fun of it afterwards. "'Aye, that she would,' rejoined the other. "'She had a merry heart. "'A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, "'as nice and neat as waxwork. "'My old eyes have seen them, aye, "'and these old hands touched them too.' 
Ay, that she would, rejoined the other. She had a merry heart. A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, as nice and neat as waxwork. My old eyes have seen them. Ay, and those old hands touched them too, for I have helped her scores of times. Stretching forth her trembling fingers as she spoke, the old creature shook them exultingly before her face, and fumbling in her pocket, brought out an old time-discolored hin snuff-box, from which she shook a few grains into the outstretched palm of her companion, and a few more into her own. While they were thus employed, the matron, who had been impatiently watching until the dying woman should awaken from her stupor, joined them by the fire, and sharply asked how long she was to wait. "'Not long, mistress,' replied the second woman, looking up into her face. "'We have none of us long to wait for death. "'Patience, patience! He'll be here soon enough for us all.' "'Hold your tongue, you doting idiot,' said the matron sternly. "'You, Martha, tell me, has she been in this way before?' "'Often,' answered the first woman. "'But will never be again,' added the second one. "'That is, she'll never wake again but once. "'And mind, mistress, that won't be for long.' "'Long or short,' said the matron, snappishly, "'she won't find me here when she does wake. "'Take care, both of you, how you worry me again for nothing. "'It's no part of my duty to see all the old women in the house die, "'and I won't, that's more. "'Mind that, you impudent old harridans. "'If you make a fool of me again, I'll soon cure you, I warrant you.' "'She was bouncing away when a cry from the two women "'who had turned towards the bed caused her to look round. "'The patient had raised herself upright "'and was stretching her arms towards them. "'Who's that?' she cried in a hollow voice. "'Hush, hush,' said one of the women, stooping over her. "'Lie down, lie down.' "'I'll never lie down again alive,' said the woman, struggling. "'I will tell her. Come here, nearer. Let me whisper in your ear.' She clutched the matron by the arm, and forcing her into a chair by the bedside, was about to speak. When looking round, she caught sight of the two old women bending forward in the attitude of eager listeners.' "'Turn them away,' said the woman, drowsily. "'Make haste! Make haste!' The two old crones, chiming in together, began pouring out many piteous lamentations that the poor dear was too far gone to know her best friends, and were uttering sundry protestations that they would never leave her, when the superior pushed them from the room, closed the door, and returned to the bedside. On being excluded, the old ladies changed their tone, and cried through the keyhole that old Sally was drunk— which, indeed, was not unlikely, since, in addition to a moderate dose of opium prescribed by the apothecary, she was laboring under the effects of a final taste of gin and water, which had been privily administered, in the openness of their hearts, by the worthy old ladies themselves. "'Now listen to me,' said the dying woman aloud, as if making a great effort to revive one latent spark of energy." In this very room, in this very bed, I once nursed a pretty young creature that was brought into the house with her feet cut and bruised with walking, and all soiled with dust and blood. She gave birth to a boy and died. Let me think, what was the year again? Never mind the year, said the impatient auditor. What about her? I, murmured the sick woman, relapsing into her former drowsy state. What about her? What about... I know, she cried, jumping fiercely up, her face flushed and her eyes starting from her head. I robbed her, so I did. She wasn't cold. I tell you, she wasn't cold when I stole it. Stole what, for God's sake? cried the matron, with a gesture as if she would call for help. It, replied the woman, laying her hand over the other's mouth. The only thing she had. She wanted clothes to keep her warm and food to eat, but she had kept it safe and had it in her bosom. It was gold, I tell you, rich gold that might have saved her life. Gold, echoed the matron, bending eagerly over the woman as she fell back. Go on, go on. Yes, what of it? Who was the mother? When was it? She charged me to keep it safe replied the woman with a groan, and trusted me as the only woman about her. I stole it in my heart when she first showed it me hanging round her neck, and the child's death perhaps is on me besides. They would have treated him better if they had known it all. Known what? asked the other. Speak. The boy grew so like his mother, said the woman, rambling on and not heeding the question, that I could never forget it when I saw his face. "'Poor girl, poor girl. She was so young, too. Such a gentle lamb. Wait, 
There's more to tell. I have not told you all, have I? No, no, replied the matron, inclining her head to catch the words, as they came more faintly from the dying woman. Be quick, or it may be too late. The mother, said the woman, making a more violent effort than before. The mother, when the pains of death first came upon her, whispered in my ear that if her baby was born alive and thrived, the day might come when it would not feel so much disgraced to hear its poor young mother named. And, oh, kind heaven, she said, folding her thin hands together, whether it be boy or girl, raise up some friends for it in this troubled world, and take pity upon a lonely, desolate child abandoned to its mercy. The boy's name? demanded the matron. They called him Oliver, replied the woman feebly. The gold I stole was... Yes, yes, what? cried the other. She was bending eagerly over the woman to hear her reply, but drew back instinctively as she once again rose, slowly and stiffly, into a sitting posture, then, clutching the coverlid with both hands, muttered some indistinct sounds in her throat and fell lifeless on the bed. "'Stone dead,' said one of the old women, hurrying in as soon as the door was open. "'And nothing to tell after all,' rejoined the matron, walking carelessly away." The two crones, to all appearance, too busily occupied in the preparations for their dreadful duties to make any reply, were left alone, hovering about the body. End of chapter 24